Hi, Amos. Hi, Summer. Uh, okay. Thank you for joining me on how do we as interns pivot in, into the teletherapy world, especially with COVID-19. And uh, I want us to have a conversation about not only what you did, but also recognizing that you did it halfway into your internship. And we are speaking to people who might be literally either starting out or will pivot like you, but may not have the relationship that you built with your site or your clients. So it's for interns and thinking about that, I would start out by just saying, how did you pivot? What struck you about your pivoting? Some high points. I'll start in just saying that I, I think it's actually a wonderful pivot in a lot of ways. And so um, if there are fears about it not being uh, enough over telehealth or using a video, I, I think if we can reframe that and look at it as opportunities for different ways of working, um, I've really been able to find a lot of connection with clients and there's even like a feeling that our energy is transferring between this two dimensional medium. So I think that that was a fear of mine going into this experience um, that has not proved to be founded fully. There are complications of course, and I'm sure we'll get into those, but just to start off that I, I remember there being so much anxiety going into the internship experience um, in person and now with what's going on in the world, that might be exacerbated. But we are adaptable beings. That is our nature. That is how we have survived on this planet. And I think that um, it's really wonderful that we have the opportunity to develop relationships in this way. I don't know if you want to add to that, Summer, before I sort of head into how yeah. I pivoted. But I just wanted to do a disclaimer, I guess. Yeah, that's a great disclaimer. I also feel like of course, looking at looking back now, I just laugh at how anxious I was, at how nerve wracking it was, because it is nerve wracking. You know, we were, we've been prepping our full, you know, time at Mercy to kind of be in person therapists, you know, with the clients in the room, with the whole family. And pivoting was a bit nerve wracking and scary in the beginning because it's like, oh my God, I'm doing all of this at home. And Use, utilizing technology and how is that going to work but we are adaptable human beings and we did adapt to the times and so did our families so did the entire world you know it's not like we did it by ourselves it was a collective pivot and so that helped in a sense knowing that you're not alone in this and we're just going to have to overcome it together in a sense and, and really that it's just one session at a time I think that that was really helpful for me starting out and that's what grounded me during this transition. Just when I transitioned to telehealth, I had just doubled my caseload maybe two weeks before, or maybe a month before. And so while I had been able to develop um, maybe four or five sessions in person with some of my clients, with one, I did an intake in person the week before and the second week we met on um, online. And so I've been able to both develop relationships in person that then transition to online and online from the, from the beginning. Um, and I think really grounding myself in just, okay, I'm here, I am with this person. I am letting the outside world permeate as much as it needs to for the client, but I can hold that space for both of us that these are 45 minutes of connection. Um, and that's been helpful for me when it started feeling overwhelming with all of the change that was happening and, and the what my clients were going through as well, which was a, a really similar experience to what was happening for me. And that's something that we don't have often in therapy, that there's this global conversation um, to navigate. Mm -hmm. I want to come back to that. I want to go to you, Summer, and say... Did you have clients that you picked up after COVID started and like Amos, so you had a mix as well? Mm -hmm. And I think going back to that idea of it was a collective um, shift for everyone in the world. So a lot of people started picking up therapy and wanting services, wanting that connection um, to help navigate themselves in the world that's changing as we speak. 
So let's build on that. Let's talk a little bit about client engagement and the therapeutics, and then we can come back to technological details. Um, how did you navigate that with your clients? And maybe their concerns about connecting or feeling uncomfortable. Did they have those questions? I think I'll start with this one. I think um, Amos said something, it's one session at a time. That's one, that we have to constantly remind ourselves and remind our clients, right? Um, for me personally, it was really individual to the client, really um, dependent on their age, um, where they are in life, and to really individualizing it, but also connecting it to the therapeutic relationship and to their surroundings as well. So that really helped with client engagement, you know, um, navigating where they're at, what they have access to, what we're able to utilize. Because when you're in physically in um, a setting, there are resources that you can use. But when you're, you know, when everybody's at home and in their own home and you don't really know, you kind of have to kind of renegotiate a lot of things, um, boundaries. How did you do that? Like when I, I, I hear you talking about this, I'm thinking without violating client confidentiality, could you share some small examples? Yeah, I mean, for a few clients, we had to constantly re remind them. Well, I had to constantly remind them and they had to be constantly reminded of, hey, remember, right, is everything okay? I know you have this amount of people in the, in the home. Um, can we speak right now? Is right now a perfect time? Um, for other clients, like for example, the younger clients, you have to kind of give them a set space. So, hey, remember that spot in your room that you feel comfortable in? Do you wanna go there and then we can start talking? Okay, cool. And um, just connecting everyone, the family as well. You know, we're a family therapist, so we, if the client has a family member or if there's a guardian, if the, per the person is a minor, always touching in with them and seeing how the setting is, how the atmosphere is, the environment. Um, and like Amos said, taking it one session at a time because it's not set in stone. It's so funny, I had a different experience from summer at the start of um, quarantine, which was, I felt like I opened up my computer and each time I was kind of like, where are you at? <laughs> haven't seen you since this started. Like, are we in a full panic mode? Are you sort of disassociating from what's happening in the world? Are you processing? And I had to be really flexible with what I had thought therapy was going to be to what it emerged in this experience, which sometimes was just um, disseminating information. And by that, I mean really um, asking questions like, you know, how often are you looking at the news? You seem really anxious. Are you are you checking the news every day? What? How are you finding support in, in person or in ways of virtual or phone it, that weren't as pressing before this experience? But now, it, the responsibility that I felt to my clients really shifted, and I can speak more about that later. But but one of one of the big shifts was what are you doing outside of the therapy space? We only have these 45 minutes together. What does life look like for you? Can we figure out ways to build some structure in your life? Because for a lot of my clients, they lost their jobs. They were going from a social life to a non-existent social life. If people were trying to date or if a relationship ended, there was that loss. Um, so it, it felt at the beginning a lot more active and a lot more sometimes crisis management. Um, and then things were able to settle for most people. And I also just want to acknowledge that I did lose some cases that some clients due to finances or due to the depth of the work that we needed to do in our therapeutic relationship just didn't feel constructive during this time of global pandemic. Um, so termination, I just want to bring up as well, mm -hmm. because that was such a fear starting out. That That is a part of this process. That That's a part of being an intern. Like when does a client fire you? Or what if I do something wrong? So how do you not take it personally when they say, this is not working for me? I mean, finances apart, for some people it's not working because of finances. That's very clear. But if they are saying this is not working, and how do you navigate that new intern fear, anxiety, and 
I don't know why it's not working. I mean, I'll share my first termination story, which was pre quarantine, but just briefly, I was working with a couple who were two men in their mid to late fifties, um, a new relationship. And, uh, after about six sessions, they emailed our front desk and said, we want to work with the therapist that's more senior. And I was like, oh, biggest fear, realized just salt in the wound. And, um, and so for me, then it comes to ethics and professional values of this is a person who is paying for a service. They have every right, if this is not the right fit for them, to be able to find something that is a good fit. And so I felt a little bit unfinished in that I didn't get to have a conversation with them. That, and so I reached out and just emailed and said, you know, I understand that you, you wish to no longer work together. I hope that you, you know, continue to think about one thing that we've thought about during our six sessions, which is this. Um, I know you're, you'll be in good hands with other therapists therapists and that our center is always open for you mm -hmm. should you you know choose to come back or, or find another therapist and then I went into supervision and cried and processed uh, my own feeling of rejection and then exploring what went wrong mm -hmm. right to not just say oh it's them they weren't ready for therapy but to go you know what I did not join enough with the the presenting client of the couple, the person that had initiated therapy, I hadn't accommodated enough what he felt the issues were. I sort of went in and was like, well, here's the thing. And, and so that was a really great lesson going forward for me. So that, that's beautiful, Emma, because I think you, you're talking about the layers in there and that's so important, right? Um, I, I want to pick up on a thread you brought up, uh, joining versus accommodating. And in these times, because of this digital world, we, 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 and there is some amount of like not knowing, so you may accommodate not knowing that you're accommodating, right? So how do we bridge through, even though you said that, uh, uh, that we need to rethink what and how we think the digital world is, virtual connections can feel human and can actually, because we've been doing it in some ways, this will be in the, uh, in the advantage for the interns coming in that the clients that they're going to be working with have all kind of, this is the universal global experience. We're all kind of oriented as human spirits, oriented to the digital. What do we do to make it more um, connecting, more joining? And I think some of you started to speak about it a little bit. Can you, can you also expand on um, like that room thing? Can, can, what's your place? Do you do anything to bring expansion rather than this kind of boxed in feeling that we're in? How do you connect to the body though? Yeah, I think you've got to be as open-minded and open and willing to connect and join with your client, even in this little square box that you see in front of you. Um, and that really, and showing them that this is a safe space, even though it's virtual, that I will hold all, all of your secrets and all of, you, all of my, all of your time and my time, right? And so it's just constantly checking in first, right? Is everything okay? Here's your space, here's my space, look around. Um, um, what are your interests, right? If it's a new client, what are you interested in? What do you like, what don't you like? Being as creative as possible, um, you know, painting. We, I've done painting with clients. Um, How do you do that? Uh, I, I'm interrupting you, finish your list and then come back to how do you do that? Yeah, I mean, you think we're just talking, but there's so much you can do with teletherapy. And that's what I mean by opening up. It's a whole world, you know, and just, you don't even know, you don't even realize that we're talking digitally or we're painting digitally. You would think the person is in the room with you once you allow yourself to open up and be comfortable. And, and once you know that you're in a safe environment, you know, all the, the, everything comes down, right? Your guard comes down and you're, just when that is there, anything is possible, right? Anything's endless. Just like when you're in the therapy room and so much is happening. And then when time is up, you're like, oh, okay. We were in the therapy room this whole time. Thank you for your time. And I'll see you next week. So it's like the same thing, but, and that's, it's fear, honestly. The fear of not being able to 
connect virtually is what holds a lot of people back, even clients, you know, not just, and, and us as therapists. And once you're able to let that come down, you can connect in a way that. So does it come back to this opening statement that Amos and you were making? It's, it's seeing it as a land of possibilities, a space for new things to emerge and don't, in some ways it's great for the new interns because they're not been in the room. So it's like, then how do you, let's shift a little bit. Amos, were you going to add to that, uh, that question? I'm jumping ahead of joining versus. Uh, just very briefly, I think getting clients embodied has been very important for me. And also, you know, I just did an intake before this and I was talking with my client about where uh, he was feeling things. And I said, you know, one of the limitations of this is that I can only see you from here up. Mm -hmm. So yes, that is frustrating. And at the same time, it's an offering for you to take a bit more ownership of this experience. And mm -hmm. we'll try to create moments of pause for you to tell me that your hands are clenched, right? And I can't see them or that your feet are on the ground. And so I've found, and this is my practice as a yoga instructor before this, is, is that there is a great deal of mindfulness focus that is very helpful for this space. Like Summer said, if there's a lot of distraction going on, how do we create this vessel of time? Is there a way that we can take a moment with some clients, we do like a minute or two of quiet mindfulness before starting and so I just want to offer something Summer said, which was pause and silence and how that was such a challenge for me and continues to be as a therapist, but that works. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Wonders. Say that again, Summer. It works wonders. Yes. yes. And it works on this medium as well. Just, just, just to be in your own body enough to hold that space of tension of, am I supposed to ask a question? Are they supposed to bring something up? what is unfolding and not to rush that. That is my continual mm -hmm. sort of conversation with myself. In some ways, um, gosh, this conversation can go in so many directions. You bring such important things because um, your earlier point too, Amos, about um, like, like the body and grounding, I'm jumping back to this current point. We want clients to kind of be present to, to what's happening for them. And so the space in a creative way is orienting us that way, right? And in some other ways, like you were saying, Summer, it's bringing us into their lives. What's your favorite space? They're not just talking. We're literally in that space with them. And they can talk and show you that space. Uh, I have a client who, who does her own business. She was picking up her stuff and showing her creative stuff. And I was able to get into a creative world through her creative um, artifacts, so it's that kind of excited space that I'm thinking about. Um, and, and something else you said, like pause, but oh, I'm forgetting it, Amos, I'll come back. Something that you said earlier, I wanted to come back to, and, and you said as beginning, beginning therapist, um, okay, let it go. So that's the other thing, you have to let go things. <laughs> we can rewind, we're, we're recording, so that's also good. Yes. Which is, I think, that's the best advice that I got starting yeah. out is that yeah. you can go back. Yeah. Like you can, if it's, if it's one session at a time, you have the time between session to reflect on your experience and come into the next session. And at some time at the beginning, whenever it feels comfortable, say, you know, last session we were talking about this and I had another question about this or the power of an apology. Mm -hmm. I feel like I didn't see what you were talking about. Can we revisit that? Is that okay? that holds so much power. So technology speeds things up for many of us. And what I would just encourage us all to do is to slow down and really focus in on the person you're speaking of. Can I bridge just into tech quickly? Sure, go for it. So right now on my screen, I see Dr. Baba and Summer and I can go in and minimize that. And so now I'm really just focusing on the person in front of me. And that's a really beautiful offering that I wish I had figured out earlier in the process <laughs> for my clients, because I saw a lot of sort of distraction, darting, checking myself out. Oh, how do I look? And that's the, the Zoom fatigue that we've been reading about. Mm -hmm. But just as you begin intake, set up the frame of how this works. What happens if we lose a connection? Um, you know, what happens if, uh, you know, we can't connect. How are we going to get in touch with one another? There's a bit more immediacy that I feel 
-hmm. in this day and age if I if you miss a session and we have an established relationship I feel the need to reach out and make sure everything's okay because so that responsibility of the therapist is what in real time or on online it's still there that if your client doesn't show up and it's your job on if you are running late, how do you connect with your client? How do you let them know when you're coming on? Mm -hmm. But also just the frame of, okay, we're meeting on Zoom, we're meeting on Doxy. Um, what are the limitations of both of those? What are the advantages of both of those? What does your site say mm -hmm. that you should use? Did um, your site decide for you or did you pick your device, I mean, platform? We began with Doxy um, because initially Zoom hadn't been allowed to be HIPAA compliant. Um, and then I have found personally that Doxy glitches uh, much more often. Um, and so I have one or two clients that for confidentiality purposes don't uh, prefer to use Doxy, but otherwise I'm completely on Zoom. Mm -hmm. How about you, Summer? Zoom or some other? My clients, my clients, my site didn't really have a specific um, platform to use, but they just gave us a range and we had to kind of do it client by client you know what do they prefer and so that's what i've been doing mm. wow that's a lot of flexibility because i i use vc and uh, there's one client who had challenges connecting so we moved to zoom and then literally earlier the week she she reconfigured her computer everything was working so we came online it, it was on zoom and then we kind of did what you're saying, that technology becomes part of the therapeutic process, part of the therapeutic relationship, right? It's not like, oh, this is the platform through which we are connecting. Audio, video, um, the, the technological connection as in your wireless or wired, all of that affects the experience, right? And so first we say, oh, we'll do it after, after the session, we'll check. And then we're like, oh, let's do it now. And that moment of playing, of going back and forth, and then, she came on to the VC and it worked and it was like, great. And that was my position that I, I find comfort in using. I mean, now almost every teletherapy platform um, and communication platforms have been HIPAA, made HIPAA compliant or whatever that means. It's for another ethics class. We'll talk later. So, so coming back to um, technology, let's stay on that and then come back to sites a bit. What did it take, like if you were to do a mental technology checklist, what did it take to get prepared? And did you have to add, did you bring equipment on board? Can I just begin by saying that there's a certain amount of privilege in this yes. conversation to be able to do telehealth. And so yes. that goes into flexibility as well. Uh, and that is a privilege. So I just want to uh, Thank you for saying that. Line of that. And it's privilege on both sides, right? Mm -hmm. The client also has privilege and sometimes the therapist also has privilege. And talking about technology, not all our interns can have space as privilege, technology yep. as privilege. And we are in New York City, by the way, at, at Mercy, uh, they may have a lot of technology available for us to, to go online. But in our homes, what happens in New York City is the walls can affect the si signal strength. I'm always challenged by the wireless mm -hmm. connection within my house. So mm -hmm. it can affect call quality. So I'm, I'm just, thank you for bringing up privilege and access to resources. Mm -hmm. What did it take? How did you, how did you organize yourself technologically, mics and computers and? I find that uh, headphones for me is very important. Um, I have a sound, I, I'm, privileged enough to have my own space to do therapy in. Um, I did for the first couple days of quarantine have to navigate space with my partner, um, which meant I was in a bedroom or I was in, um, I was able to go to a friend's apartment uh, for a couple hours out of the day. So th there are ways to be uh, mindful about setting up more limited space. But um, I have a sound machine outside of my door and I use headphones. And that's what I also suggest to my clients because I want them, I want to mirror to them confidentiality, which is that you may have other people in, but you, what is it, how is that part of the therapeutic process to give someone the agency to say, hey, I have my therapy session from this time to this time. Um, I'm going to put a sound machine outside the door. Can I please trust you not to listen in? Can mm -hmm. I, you know, can this be my time for me? Mm -hmm. But also to be conscious of 
what Summer was saying, who's with you right now? Is there someone, if you're sort of sensing that someone's uncomfortable about speaking about something, how can you work around that? Is it possible if they have headphones in that they don't have to say that person's name? Or, you know, we have to be very mindful of what the experience is like there. But in terms of setup, it really was just, I had my laptop, I plugged in some $20 headphones, um, and I figured out some lighting that made me feel like I could be seen by my clients. But I would encourage you not to invest in a whole setup unless that's a part of your personal life, right? Unless that's a part of your creativity or, or how you wish to express yourself. Yeah, I, I agree with, like Amos touched on a lot of points. Um, for me personally, I was with family. So I had my setup as well and, you know, had my space. Um, I picked this one spot so my clients don't feel like they're like going to get whiplash every time they see me. That was um, really important for me too, Summer. Yeah. Um, the, the setup is the same thing, just the laptop. And then the platform, we did a lot of navigating between me and the clients, what worked best for them. Um, on their internet access and what they had. So that plays a role as well. Um, and also just like navigating time and space with family members, if you are with family members, right? Because everyone has a job, everyone's in school and now everything is at home. And so now everybody has to have a time and a place and to be mindful constantly. So, um, you know, I'm fortunate enough for me where like once everything was navigated at home, it was fine. Everybody knew my time and my space. Um, and one, um, nobody spoke to me unless I came out just to be mindful of just in case you're in session or you're doing whatever it is that you're doing. Um, and so it's also just navigating time afterwards with everyone else and when to close this laptop, <laughs> when to just be done. Because right, right. time, time does a, a role. That's such a beautiful point. And I, if I can offer one piece of advice, it's if your site does 45 minute sessions, don't go over 50 minutes and take 10 minutes off of your screen. I found myself sort of falling into email in those breaks and it was not sustainable for me. So get up and walk away, have a bio break, get water, do what you yeah, need to do. Because that's what you would be doing in person. You would walk your client to the door at least and you would have a minute to like, stretch or you know yeah do the stretching yeah uh-huh um so make sure that you're not just becoming an extension of the screen um and again this is no different than when you're in person right how do you do care for yourself like how do you shift you're talking about space as in this virtual space but we're talking also physical and now you're starting to talk about your emotional and your head space so mm -hmm. so your own biology has to be with you for you to be fully present. So what, mm -hmm. what, what would you do anyways with that? And how do you bring that mindfulness to the space? Um, speaking of space, how did you navigate space with your family, if I may ask? Um, and both of you, yeah. Like, what kinds of conversations does it take? Because family is curious. And, and again, talking of privilege, if you're a parent versus you're a child, like if you, if you may be an adult living with your parents, there is that power differential like dad's knocking in and saying what are you doing and will mom give me the space and my brothers gets more than I do sometimes and like how do you and you, you may not have had those issues but I'm just curious what it takes. Summer you want to take it away and I'll follow. Um, I think for me personally it really depends on the family it depends on who you are as a person. Um, more so for me, my family was just curious, like, so what are you guys talking about? So what was this client about? And I'm like, I'm not telling you anything. Um, and it was honestly, they were more concerned with me eating, <laughs> honestly, and just taking a break, you know, because it's like you're, you're in there all day, you know, when have you gotten up? Have you stretched? Did you even drink water? You know, so it's just like they were kind of constantly reminding me to take more time for me which is understandable, but also as therapists, we really, we take our role really seriously as mental health clinicians. And I think, especially for us, we took that shift from in-person to tele telehealth and we really wanted to, well, I really wanted to kind of make sure that I was doing it right in the beginning. And then like Amos said, it did end up becoming an extension of me where it was like, okay, now I need to kind of learn the boundaries between the computer and myself as a person um the computer is not my client 
but yet I'm constantly keeping it open and checking for everything and making sure that everyone's okay. I'm done with them, but now I'm sending them an email or reminding them something or, you know, so it's just like reminding myself what was life like when I was in person and how can I create a medium space in between that. Yeah, something that's also coming up is that when you start your internship, you will have very few cases and that, that that's okay. And that is actually a beautiful way to begin this experience. So that's a bit different. Uh, I know Summer and I had a, had a big caseload when this happened. And so I just noticed that the conversation is circling around that much time in front of a computer, but that's sort of because of the, the caseload that we take. And that may be a consideration that you want to make throughout your internship experience as you navigate with your site, what their expectations are, you know what Mercy's expectations are in terms of hours for the year. But um, th this is fatiguing, I find, in a different way. And uh, this transition for me was very exhausting at first. So just, I wanted to sort of bring that up as I was thinking about it. Can, can I build on that? And maybe we'll take another five minutes or so of more of the conversation. Um, there is this idea of, of when you start seeing clients, like, what did I do and how did I do, right? And when you're at your site, you have people to go and talk to, right? You have breaks between clients. Like you said, when you start out with one or two clients a week or something like that, was, you're probably even getting to see other, other therapists. Um, but when we're at home, we don't have that right away. So, and, and since you, again, pivoted in the middle, you've already created a system, but it's natural to take other people's story and find it landing in places that either surprises you or how to hold that energy. Um, did, you, did you ever reach out to your colleagues or supervisors and, and just talk between and not wait till times, uh, like, like class times to meet with your supervisor or your site supervisor? I uh, was fortunate enough to have a cohort that met weekly during this transition and the first two weeks that we did not meet and I really felt a difference. Um, I also create, you know, I would check in with two of my cohort from Mercy like once a week or every other week and we'd have a quick hour of sort of just peer supervision. I think that that's so vital right now as you're starting out. Um, so and in terms of supervision, my, my experience with my supervisor was very generous of like, if you need me more than our hour, um, that's great. Your supervisor may not, but may need to make their own boundaries for themselves and that's fine, but you do have other people. And I, what I would suggest is like what Summer was saying, you know, there's a difference between talking to your partner or to your parent about what's going on for you versus talking to another clinician. And I just would really, this is my own personal bias, but I would encourage you to find people who have been trained as opposed to people who do not, because it will color your experience. And especially if someone's in the same part of the experience as you, that's really invaluable, I think. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, I agree with everything Amos said. I, If I didn't have other therapist numbers, we, I had an email and I would ask them a question. Um, my supervisor was great with keeping in touch. Um, I used to also have group supervision as well. And also your classmates. Just remember your classmates are all going through this with you and you can always message and ask them questions as well because they may not know the answer, but may, they may be thinking the same questions as you. And um, being able to brainstorm together is much better than doing it alone. Mm -hmm. as, a, as a practicum supervisor, you're also making me think of how I need to be making sure that they create that buddy system because when you take trains together or car rides together it, there is this thing that happens by accident that you create your little teams of support um so if we start out that way which is in class then it'll be there somewhat the conditions if not by design because we can't bring what we're feeling not just for client confidentiality but it's also care for your family members and dump on them because they're like what wow, what, you're looking always heavy and down. Is this the right work for you? Because their, mm -hmm. their love and concern can block you. And when you're yourself saying, should I be doing this work or not? That's not the best voice. You Like to your point, Amos, you want a supervisor or a peer saying how to hold that energy, right? Mm -hmm. That is what training is. But it's also um, like, I, I will let my partner know something heavy happened in session. So if you see a dark cloud, it's not our family life. I'm okay, I'm processing, right? 
But if it's my kid, he'll say, so what happened? You know, because he's the curious kind. But mm -hmm. that knowing that boundary of what to speak about and how to speak is part of the learning. And that to bring it in supervision and, and talk about where that energy lands. So um, any anything else that, I mean, we've touched on so much. I'm just saying, we, I don't overwhelm, but we this is already. why all this conversation needs to come <laughs> back into supervision, right? Yeah. I, one thing that I want to just bring up is we've been talking a lot about flexibility and being there for our clients. And I just also want to mention being there for yourself and being very, very clear with your own feeling of safety and your own sense of um, professionalism, I think is a word that I would use. So for example, like Summer and, and Dr. Baba's backgrounds are very neutral and mine is not. And so mm -hmm. that's a consideration that you want to try to take into it can happen anywhere, of course, but you might want to clear the wall. Like what's behind you has come up in conversation for me in the room. Mm -hmm. And as well as we're not in an office setting. And so that's both very different. Like yesterday I had a client who was folding laundry for the first five minutes and it was not productive for our session. It might have been in a different person, but it was like in and out of the screen. And and I you know, said, oh, hey, sorry, can we, do you want me to set up another time to meet? Do you want to take five minutes and finish that? This is kind of distracting for me. So don't be shy about creating the kind of therapeutic space where you feel like there will be the ability for your client to focus, because I find that focus is something that's, that is different here. Yes, be flexible, but also trust yourself to generously help your client by being able to really focus their time and energy into this 45 minutes or an hour, however long your session is. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Someone for you, anything that um, comes up? I think, yeah, just be mindful of yourself because you, you may allow for it once, but over time, it'll snowball and then you'll just wonder how did I get to this point? So catch yourself constantly. Yeah. And if you don't catch yourself, but it was on your mind, mention it to someone and they'll catch it, you know? So that's what we mean by connecting and communicating with mm -hmm. other like-minded individuals who can help you navigate this process because mm -hmm. it is a process. And, and it is a communal process. I mean, we need others. It's not just your mm -hmm. journey. Yeah. Sorry, you were going to stay? Just enjoy the ride. Try the right, yeah. I, 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 closing, I will say everything that we're talking about needs to come back into supervision uh, with your practicum supervisors and with your site supervisors because this is a new phenomenon, like this notion of privacy and confidentiality. You as a therapist may want privacy, but what if I have a room with my bed and I'm just messy and everything is all around me? I'm like, ah, oh, I don't want to do online therapy but there is a way you can create that sense of privacy for you, right? Because there is a professionalism that affects how our clients hear what we are saying. And if your client is super organized and you're not, they're already judging you and you may be not connecting. So when you talk about client engagement, so many things are at play and being able to come into conversation and talk about it and nuance it. Like I'm, I'm, I'm leaving you hanging. What's the difference between privacy and confidentiality? And, um, those kinds of things are, I think, somewhere to your point, to also conversations that belong with the client. So it's not just with your peers and supervisors. Also, how do we navigate as uh, Amos, you was talking about the clothes folding or cooking. Cooking and mm -hmm. painting can be great spaces to do therapy, but if the person is in and out, what do you do? Mm -hmm. um, so it, it's been great. I'm going to be sharing this video and can people connect with you? Because they'll be like, hey, and if so, where can they reach you? If, if you're not, they, they, you can say through mercy only, because I think this video might go public in some place. We'll talk about it if it does. Um, sure, yeah. you can connect with me through my last name, dot my first name at gmail.com. It's wolf, W-O-L-F-F -F, dot A-M-O-S at gmail.com. Um, and I'm happy to, you know, answer questions. I, I also just quickly, I'm going to plug the New York Marriage and Family Therapy Network. If Absolutely. you're a New Yorker looking at this, um, we're hoping, we're doing a lot of really cool programming, a lot of really wonderful opportunities for community and for connection. 
um, and trying to reestablish our mentorship program, which I hope will include student or uh, emerging professional to student. Um, and so just find whether it's NYMFTN or another organization, that that's another area of community and the ability to connect with um, professionals like our teachers at Mercy College has been a really important part of my stability throughout a really tumultuous time. Thank you, Hamas. And you can, you can also email me at my first name, last name, at awell.com, S-O-M-E-R-S-A-L-E-H at awell.com. And I highly recommend NYMFTN because it's, it's going places right now. It's great, it's great for connection. Thank you both and congratulations. You are graduating in literally a couple of weeks. Okay. There is a light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah. Yay. So, thank you. Good luck, new cohort. You're going to be great. You're going to do awesome. <laughs>